right. Yeah, so um, a couple of years ago when we started working on Micronos, um, it was sort of an opportunity to work on Atomics also since we're moving to a new architecture. Uh, I think we learned we learned a lot from uh, work with Comcast in the past and things like that. And I wanted to address a lot of the, the issues that we saw there. And so, but since, I mean, uh, so tons of work has been done on Atomics and we're using it extensively. Um, but I think uh, I've, I've still, I've always been promising to do a talk about what changed and I never did. And so this is that talk. <clears throat> And so first I want to start with what sort of the goals were uh, based on the lessons that we learned from working with uh, Atomics and Raft and things like that in uh, Classic Onos. <clears throat> so first was uh, we wanted to keep the, the primitives and one of, my, one of my big goals was to improve Atomics and make sure that it was backward compatible so that we could still use it uh, to improve Classic Onos because we were sticking with that for a while. Um, <clears throat> But obviously moving to uh, the cloud, moving to a new language, uh, probably the biggest thing was making it language ag agnostic so we could have clients in multiple languages and build applications in different languages uh, and not be tied to Java. <clears throat> Another thing is like one, one of the big, um, one, of the, one of the big things that we did in Classic Onos was, uh, just having the ability to use lots of different uh, protocols or whatever store was basically right for the job and I wanted to preserve that uh, ability in some way. Uh, one of the challenges that we ran into with Classic Onos was uh, implementing ISS, uh, ISSU. So basically uh, being able to upgrade things. Uh, a lot of the stuff in Classic Onos just was not built from the ground up uh, to be able to tolerate um, like refactoring and API changes and things like that. And so I wanted to make sure that this was built from the ground up so that we could uh, support that in the future. And then the last thing was we were moving to a new platform. And in Java, when Classic Onus was, was first built, there was no uh, Kubernetes. And so Atomics actually did a lot of the work of doing cluster management and things like that. But now we have a better tool for that, which is Kubernetes. And so the goal was to try to delete as much code as possible that relates to uh, cluster management and let Kubernetes do as much of that work as possible without, without creating a, a strict dependency on Kubernetes. I think Andrea asked about if, we, if it had to be run on Kubernetes and the answer is no, there's nothing that ties the actual primitives to, to Kubernetes and I made, uh, I was careful to make sure of that. <laughs> and so I was thinking about how how to explain the architecture because it's sort of it's sort of complex, and so I wanted to um, explain it from the perspective of the changes, like how we got from what we had in Java to how we get got to what we have now. And so I'll go through all the basically the evolution from the Java version of Atomics uh, to the cloud native basically version of Atomics. So first was replacing the API. This was the biggest thing. And it was, the, it was actually the first thing that I did. So we wanted to preserve the <clears throat> primitive abstraction, but be able to have client, we're starting to write application in Go. We need, we need a Go client. Uh, we want backward compatibility for classic owners, like I said, so we want a Java client. Protobus gives us all of this. Um, similarly for upgrades, it solves the schema evolution problem. You can add fields, you can uh, remove fields and things like that um, without, without breaking backward compatibility. And so we can do um, rolling upgrades with, with Protobuf. And then um, I also implemented some conventions to make sure that we can do future refactoring without uh, breaking backward compatibility. And so there's a new uh, project. It's much like the Onos API. Uh, there's an Atomics API project, which defines the uh, Protobuf uh, API. It's very similar to the Onos API repo, a Java client, a Go client, Python client, things like that. And this client or just compiled? Yeah, those are the generated, yeah, the, okay. the Proton uh, output, basically. Okay. 
So to look at what some of these look like, this is an example of the map primitive. So the map primitive used to be basically in Java interface, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's a now it's a protobuf service. Uh, there's RPCs for each operation. There are, you see all these, uh, there's a bunch of like options on here. So these are used to basically describe the primitive. So this says that this primitive is partitionable, uh, uh, gives it a name, assigns numeric IDs to each operation, says whether they're reads or writes. And this allows, uh, this allows us to do code generation to basically generate a lot of the code for uh, primitives. So there's this project called uh, Proto, what is it, Protogen Star? Yeah. It's like a Go project that basically is a toolkit for taking protobuf files and writing code generators, code generators for them. And so in this, uh, so there's a, a Go framework. Uh, this has a code generator that basically takes the, the, the protobuf files uh, and generates a lot of the Go code that's for them. So it generates uh, really nice uh, state machine APIs and clients and things like that. And so that allows us to do, uh, it makes it much easier to maintain because I can just modify the template uh, to, to fix something or something and then generate all the code and it generates uh, a lot of different code and it makes for nice APIs. And, and it's something that's really common in Go is just uh, relying on code generation. <clears throat> yeah, and then uh, this is these are some examples of what the actual requests look like. Each each uh, RPC has a request and response uh, that basically just take like this entry is basically the key value pair. Um, and then also associated, so each primitive has two services. So there's a primitive service and then there's a manager service. And the manager basically gives you an instance of a primitive. So it gives you a session ID, which is used as a, as a header in, in the gRPC. Um, so, and this basically allows the, this basically allows us to, um, uh, implement things like caching on the back end, uh, rather than on the front end. So like one of the things we had in Java was for each primitive, there's like uh, caches and uh, read only primitives and things like that. And those are all implemented in Java for atomics. But since we want this to be reusable across languages, there had to be some way to abstract that. And this, uh, if you look at like the open session requests, it contains like options for a map and this can say, I want this map to be cached or whatever. <clears throat> and so that gives us the caching will be done by the, the auto generated client or yep. yeah. yeah. Um so, and so that gives us that basically so that takes us to this architecture. And I'm gonna go through steps that get us to the current architecture. But so then we have basically rather than previously we had this would be this would have been netty and like cryo and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have gRPC interface to primitives. <clears throat> Second was the big thing was that I want to do is move to a better raft implementation. So maintaining the like that raft implementation was created very shortly after the raft paper came out, and there were no there were there weren't very many uh, good raft implementations, and so Madon used that one. Uh, but since then, like tons of work has been done. There are so many good raft implementations, and one of the things that we get from Protobuf and or use basically uh, not depending on Java is we can use a raft implementation in any language. And Go has Go has a bunch of great ones. Uh, at CD, you can use the at CD uh, raft implementation. Uh, console has a raft implementation. I talked to the I talked to the at CD author because I actually tested all of these, and I posted my benchmarks, and he he got mad at me. <laughs> and um, he said you should check, check out Dragon Boat. And so I did. And then I actually talked to some other big, um, well known people in distributed systems, and they're also using Dragon Boat, like at Twitter and things like that. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's awesome. And it has, like, it has uh, partitioning built into it and things like that. And so 
I want to take Dragon Boat. Uh, you can look at the uh, actually find it real quick. So this is it. There are benchmarks on here and stuff. Uh, yeah, so it has, it has like uh, partitioning built in. It's crazy fast. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and so that gets us to an architecture like this now. So we have a new after implementation, a much better after implementation. Um, basically running running the but and basically the wrap the wrap so basically I re-implemented all the primitive state machines in Go so that they could run on top of this new wrap implementation and then there's a this this is basically the uh, the implementation of the atomic state guy so the so the wrap servers uh, have a gRBC server outside of them. That basically implements the primitives, and so some application can talk to those, and they're uh, they get basically on the server side translated into raft uh, entries and log. <clears throat> so third was integrate with Kubernetes, and the goal here was basically I wanted Atomics to um, look as much like a Kubernetes native feature as as a, as possible, and I'll show you what that means. Um, and so some, some of the sort of uh, the way things are done in Kubernetes is you, a lot of stuff is driven by configuration. So a lot of this was about moving, basically making everything configurable uh, inside of custom resources, which I'll show examples of, uh, so that you can configure primitives like uh, change performance and consistency characteristics and things like that. Uh, without having to change any code, and that allows things to be configured in, in Helm charts, and also integrating with Kubernetes. Um, you, there are tons of tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem that you can use, which I'm going to try to show an example of. Let's see if it's set up. Yeah, it's set up. Yeah, I'll show an example of that um, to help with uh, monitoring and debugging. <clears throat> And so the way that this is done is uh, I added some custom resources. So the Kubernetes API, you can extend it and add your own types of objects. So there are a few types of objects that Atomics adds. Um, so there's a store object, which basically just defines a, in, in this example, or in this stage, defines the raft cluster. And so if I create a store, uh, with three replicas and 10 partitions, it will create a raft cluster, a three node raft cluster with 10 raft groups. Uh, and then you can also define and configure primitives and say, for device changes in Onos config, I want an index map uh, that's stored in that specific raft cluster named Onos config. And the way this works is this is where the, the controllers come in. So when you first set up micro Onos now, uh, there are a few controllers, which I'll talk about the other ones also. Um, the first one that you install is the Atomics controller. And this, when you install the Atomics controller Helm chart, uh, it is what adds, defines these custom resources and things. Uh, and the controller runs in the kube system namespace. And basically, when a primitive, a map, or index map, or whatever is created, or when a store is created, it basically turns those into in the case of the store, like a stateful set and a bunch of pods, um, and we'll configure it to say, you know, run these state machines or whatever. Is the Atomics controller then like app specific? No. Like, but the Atomics controller is the one creating the primitives that. Yeah, and it's getting that information from here. Oh, I see. So this is what's, so yeah, when you create, what, like if you look in the Onus config chart, there's a, there's a primitives.yaml and it defines all the primitives that it use, uses. And so when you de deploy the Onos config chart, the controller will create those primitives. Yeah. It'll create those state machines. So the app will create this um, yep. uh, resources. Yeah. But it's not one controller per like a deployment no. of a service. It's like one controller per every service. Yes. Like if there is Onos top could use the same Atomics controller. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and then um, 
So that gives us to the second, that gets us to the second type of controller. So you'll notice there's another uh, kind of controller. So the challenge is that, you know, this solves, this sort of gives us a, wrap, a replacement for a wrap, which was, which was the main goal, which is a huge, uh, a huge thing, but raft wasn't raft isn't the only protocol that we use in classic onos, nor the only protocol that we want to use in micro onos. Uh, we want to be able to use different types of stores. Uh, like for um, the UE nip, currently it's using raft, which it should, which it shouldn't be because it should be um, much more. Uh, it doesn't need the it doesn't need the strong consistency, and it needs more scalability. Mm -hmm. um, and so. And also the other thing was like, I never, I really never want to be tied to a specific, uh, a specific backend again after, after um, the experience in, uh, in, in classic Ono. So I really wanted to make it possible to, to easily change things uh, if we want to. Um, and so there's a, there's basically a pluggable storage layer and that's what the second controllers give you. Um, so we can, um, add, and this basically allows us to use whatever we want that um, can store objects like primitives. Like one of the things that Adib, Adib did an experiment with Redis, because Redis, Redis, the, the Redis API looks a lot like primitives. It has lists and counters and things like that. Uh, and Adib made what, a storage uh, plugin for, for Redis. Um, yeah, and, and um, so, and in order to do this, I also didn't want to have to have different APIs for different storage backends on the front end. Like in Java, we have consistent map and eventually consistent map. And I wanted to make, I wanted to just have one set of primitives that could sort of work with any sort of backend. And so I did a lot of work on the, on the Atomics API um, to be able to make it so it could work with uh, different kinds of backends because some databases use like uh, timestamps. Some databases use like well, logical timestamps, physical timestamps. It can basically it has uh, it has options to, to basically work with all of those and still maintain uh, the consistency model. Is the Redis backend also available open source, findable? Um, we we haven't maintained it. We um, it's it's on GitHub. Yeah. Okay. We haven't we haven't maintained. It. I think we'd have to update it, um, but it was just an experiment to make sure that. Uh, no, no, I know, but uh, so we're looking at the micronos uh, for Volta, and one of the questions was because uh, one of the use cases is for for Netsia, and they have apparently a great expertise in Redis, and they would like to use it. Yeah, this is one of the things that that was my experience experience with working with other companies. Also, every company. I think it's great for an open source project because every company has some some database that they love yeah. or they have experience operating, yes. which is really important. Exactly. So people, I think it's great uh, for an open source project like this to be able to uh, to be adaptable to whatever sort of environment people want to deploy it in. And so yeah, that's so, the goal. Yeah. So thanks uh, because uh, that's it. I think they would appreciate the fact that uh, we could have this back and. Yeah, and it drives me crazy because um, especially consensus services are really hard to operate. And so many, so many uh, systems have now have like Zookeeper, etcd, um, uh, like, yeah, I think there's, there's another one. They have like multiple, multiple versions of the exact same type of database running and it's totally pointless. Uh, but and it just makes operate operations like um, a lot a lot more difficult I think. Um, yeah. So and so the way that uh, then the storage is defined. If you look in again in one of the micro onus charts, like onus complete. So this is a modification to the store uh, custom resource. So instead of the store basically being tied to some specific protocol like raft now um, basically has a, a protocol field which inside of the protocol you define another you basically configure another type of custom resource which this is the custom resource provided by the storage plugin so if, when you install the atomics raft storage chart uh, that chart is defining the multi-raft protocol 
uh, custom resource. And this basically allows you to configure specifically a RAF store. <clears throat> and so there are like RAF configuration options, RAF specific terminology like groups. Uh, you can configure persistent volumes and things like that. Uh, and when you create a store like this, the Atomics controller will then in turn create that instance of the custom resource. And then the uh, storage specific the storage specific controller will pick that up. So rather than Atomics controller, rather than one controller basically creating just things that it knows how to create, you can deploy whatever controller you want. So if you want a Redis store, you'd have to deploy the Redis controller and then create a store with uh, a Redis, like a uh, Redis storage custom resource or whatever. And then the Redis, the Redis uh, storage controller will would take that and create a Redis node or um, whatever. And so, so yeah, so so uh, this basically gets us really close to the to the architecture that we have now. When you deploy MicroNOS, you create the Atomics controller, create the RAF storage controller. All of the uh, MicroNOS charts currently only use RAF. Um, and so when you when you deploy the ST RAN chart or the Onos the Onos umbrella, um, it will create a store with multi RAF uh, protocol configuration that will create a RAF uh, a RAF cluster and then uh, configure the primitives. So so regarding the let's say the UENIB, which was basically the reason it uses RAF because it was basically a cut and paste of the topo. Yeah. Does use raft so, but it should be easy to change just in the YAML file, then basically, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I, uh, yeah, it took it took some work, but it's really important to me to be able to do all of this these changes without actually touching any code whatsoever. And so everything is yeah. So all you have to do is, um, I mean, as long as the controller is installed and and Kubernetes knows what the what. Uh, the custom resources are that you're trying to use. Uh, yeah, all you have to do is change the store uh, protocol. That's awesome. Thank you. So, in terms of like uh, persistent volumes, then like, are you using like ETCD uh, at some stage to uh, to persist this, or or how are you? I don't know what they're what 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 are. Is Andy here? No. Uh, yeah. Andy. Um, I don't know what they're using uh, in Ether. Andy does that integration, I think. Oh, yeah. But I mean, um, this is just, yeah. I mean, what was your question again, Sean? Maybe I could, maybe I could answer. Yeah. No, I was just wondering. Um, you know, if we use the the Raft protocol on on Ether, uh, how is it actually getting stored in a persistent volume? I think on um, on the cloud based deployments, I think we're using a Google Cloud volume of some sort. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the Kubernetes Kubernetes itself allows you to choose the backend storage. Yes. It's, they're not tied together. Yeah. So the persistent volume claim is a claim against your backend storage, which could be an SSD, which could be whatever you define in your sure. Kubernetes cluster to be your backend. Okay. And the Google the providers in the cloud. Uh, JKE, AWS, whatever, they give you different types of backends. For okay, that. so what I'm wondering is not, not exactly an expert. How, how does the how do you configure the multi rack protocol to tell it to use this persistent volume? Um, yeah, so this so this uh, volume claim template is uh, it's a Kubernetes. It's uh, you can find this in the Kubernetes documentation. Um, a volume claim is, is something that's native to Kubernetes, and mm -hmm. there are a few there are a few options. Like one is the storage class, so you can, like right here, I have this storage class name standard. So this is this is this storage class is available in Kind. Uh, when you create a Kind cluster, it creates your storage class name uh, standard, and that stores stuff inside of the Kind Docker container mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but you can define a store, so you can define a storage class that says to use uh, like local storage, which is a path on the serp on the host, mm. uh, or you can configure it to use uh, Google Google volume or, right. or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Or there are other there are other ways to do it. But yeah. Yeah. So somewhere somewhere in the Ether Rock 
configuration, Andy has a persistent volume thing yes. yeah. defined, and then he's referring to it here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that gets us to, oh yeah, and so, then, so yeah. Um, yeah, so like I was saying, if you have the RAF storage control, you can run a RAF cluster if you want some other type of storage. Like we, we also, actually the way that we experimented with this, or the way that we've made sure that this works is we have a, another cache, something called, it's called cache storage controller, which is basically just there for testing. Um, but yeah, it just implements a different type of storage so we can make sure that most, like, it really does work with multiple types of stores, but yeah, so if you requested like a uh, cache store or whatever, the cache store controller. So the cache is just a uh, back and on. It's just a single mode that holds, holds the, as like an end memory. It's pretty fairly really interesting. <clears throat> yeah, and the cool thing about, the, um, the great thing about using uh, Kubernetes custom resources. So the RAF storage controller actually defines a lot of different custom resources, which I'm going to show an example of now. <laughs> so when you create the RAF storage, or when you install the RAF storage controller, uh, it creates multi-RAF protocols, which is uh, the custom resource that's referenced in store configuration. Uh, creates a multi-RAF cluster, uh, custom resource, RAF. If, then the controller, when you create a multi-RAF protocol, it creates a multi-ref cluster. When you create a multi-ref cluster, that creates a ref group for each partition and ref member for each member in each partition and things like that. And then what this allows is for you to get information about all those specific things by using uh, kube control commands. So uh, automatically when you create a custom resource, you can immediately use kube control get or describe and things like that. Uh, and so if you look, I, so I deployed, so I deployed the Onos umbrella chart. Uh, it's, it's not working, but uh, yeah, I, I, I just did it really quick. Um, yeah. Um, on my machine, it doesn't survive sleep. You know, so if you put your machine mm -hmm. into sleep and you stack it up again. So say when I do oh, okay. control get stores, you can see the Onos consensus store. Uh, control get. <clears throat> and so you can see actually a lot of useful information about uh, about the RAF cluster by doing this. So you can see like which, I, I should have deployed from with multiple nodes, but you can see like uh, which RAF member is the leader for a group, uh, the RAF term. You can see when it took a snapshot. Um, snapshots are one of the things that we had a lot of trouble with uh, in uh, classic owners. You can see whether the RAF uh, group is ready or whether the member is. Uh, ready, which means that it can process uh, <clears throat> primitive calls, basically. Uh, one of the other cool things is, let's see. Come on, slow. Yeah, and if you look like uh, if you describe a pod, you can see stuff related to Atomic. So Atomic also adds events to pods. Um, let's see. Describe. Adds events to the members, so you can see when when like a when the when the uh RAF members saw like a term change or a leader change things like that and so you, you can really get a lot of insight into what's actually happening inside of the RAF protocol this way um because previously like and this is based on my <laughs> experience to, like spending endless days devoting <laughs> things for Comcast basically the only way to do that was to just take the logs and uh it, it was just impossible like figure out just figuring out when something happened, mm -hmm. like when when a leader change, leadership change, or whatever happened, uh, was a huge pain. And so this 
And so this basically integrates with the Kubernetes uh, event system uh, and status uh, system to basically tell you what, this, what the state of a RAF group or a RAF member is currently and what happened to get it there. Just awesome. All right. <clears throat> And then the, the last step on this sort of transformation was to simplify clients. So um, basically, so the architecture that we have here uh, basically puts primitives all behind a server on the server side. But the problem is like with a lot of protocols like RAF actually, so RAF gives, RAF is a consensus algorithm that gives you consensus inside of the cluster. Uh, and strong consistency inside of the RAF, like among the RAF members, but that doesn't give you strong consistency in the client, actually. Uh, in order to do that, you have to implement like a session session protocol, which basically um, ensures that that consistency extends to the client. And so in order to, and so the problem is, yeah, if we, then move sort of the primitive API closer to the clients uh, and say implement that on the client side. So implement like RAF sessions or whatever. Uh, we have to re-implement that for every language, uh, which this is the way that it was currently implemented, uh, with, with, that it was originally implemented. So there was like sessions built into the Go client. And then I was, and then when it came time to when I when I started pushing for starting to use this in Java, I was like, man, it's going to be, we're going to have to re-implement all of this stuff in Java. And so I wanted to find a way to, that we could share sort of client-side logic across languages. <clears throat> yeah, so how do you get uh, client-side protocol-specific logic? Uh, how do you share that across languages? Another example is like partitioning. So there's we also do client side partitioning because there's a cost to just sending something to the wrong server having to decide where else it's supposed to go uh doing so basically doing partitioning on the server side and so it's it's optimal to do it on the client side but in order to do that you have to make sure that every client is uh, using the same hashing algorithm and things like that and so we have to re-implement that for every client and make sure that's consistent for every client um and so the solution, the Kubernetes solution for this is using a sidecar. And so, and this is what we're doing in other places in micro OS now also. Um, and the other cool thing is that uh, when we can push this uh, sort of close, when we can, adding the sidecar also allows us to, to do like, um, uh, Share like sharing a proxy to a, like a standalone database like Etsy um, in, in, uh, across uh, different languages and things like that, or do peer to peer protocols, which I'll show, show some examples of. So, just from my understanding, the sidecar in this case means that uh, the application requests are actually going to the sidecar. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll show a little bit diagram of that. But yeah, so if you look at the this is from the Onus config Helm chart. Uh, when we create an Onos config um, deployment, there are a couple of annotations now uh, that this adds. So there's a broker annotation, which I'll talk about what the broker is, and then a, uh, there's a RAF annotation. And what these do is they tell you to uh, inject a couple of pods. So the broker annotation tells tells the atomics, the main atomics controller, to inject uh, a broker container, which I'll talk about. So if you look at um, Notice that, like, when you look at the pods in MicroOnos, there are always there are lots of pods of three containers. So, two of those containers are atomic. So, those those are the broker and the RAF uh, driver. Oops. So, what these annotations do? Yeah. So, when you create a pod. Um, Oh, I gotta remember what I, yeah, okay. Yeah, so the broker, um, 
Yeah, so this wrap storage uh, specific uh, annotation basically tells it to install a wrap driver. And so the wrap driver is uh, basically a sidecar that knows how to talk to the wrap node specifically. So, and this allows us to extend the consistency to the pod. And so actually between, so rather than uh, the pod talking to the RAF nodes using over the gRPC atomic mm -hmm. primitive interface, it can then use a RAF specific uh, protocol, which basically implements sessions uh, in the case of RAF. So, so really the gRPC that you've shown at the start of the meeting is only from yes. the app to the driver. Talks to the driver yes. So it's internal to the pod and thus is consistent. Yep. And yeah, yeah, it. yeah. And so this, yeah, since because we know that um, because we know that each pod has a separate uh, sidecar, yeah, we can basically treat the sidecar, treat what the sidecar sees as what the client sees. Okay. And so, yeah, then the driver, so the drivers implement the gRPC primitive APIs. And then in order to, so that the, um, well, but then the problem is, let's say we have multiple storage backends, say, there's a RAF storage controller and or some, the same pod wants to talk to a RAF cluster and a Redis cluster or whatever. Then we have multiple drivers. And so then the question is, uh, if the application wants to talk to some specific primitive, how does it know where to, which driver to use? And that's what the broker provides. So the broker is basically just a really small server. It's just a registry of primitives. And so in order to decouple, just so that the application doesn't know how, doesn't have to know what which protocol is uh, being used to store some specific primitive. Uh, that's what the broker broker is for. So when you create a primitive and tell it to create, tell it to uh, point it to a wrap store, um, the atomics controller will tell the broker there's um, basically to use the wrap driver or use some specific port. Or if you tell the primitive to use the uh, to use a Redis store, the atomics controller will tell the broker to tell the application to use the, the Redis driver. So if you look at the atomics API, actually, there are, there are actually a few um, sections. So this this is where all the primitives are under the primitive package. But the way that the uh, atomics controller talks to basically tells. Uh, configures the pod to know where to find different primitives are in this management um, package. Yeah, so there's this broker service. So when uh, when you create a primitive in the Kubernetes API, the Thomas controller sees the primitive and then it will it will register the primitive uh, with whatever pods are interested in talking to that primitive. And uh, the the register primitive request has basically the address. So this will, the address uh, is basically the, uh, the port of the sidecar to talk to, to access that primitive. And then the other thing is um, to be able to tolerate like changes to, um, to the protocol, like membership changes, say you want to, uh, resize a RAF cluster or whatever. Um, there's also an API so the atomics controller can update the configuration uh, inside of a driver. So if if uh, if the RAF controller says, um, oh the 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 membership changed on the RAF uh, cluster or whatever, the atomics controller gets notified of that and then it tells all of the relevant uh, sidecars about the new nodes. And that's how that's how it can tolerate uh, like cluster changes. <clears throat> this is where it gets pretty complicated. But the other cool thing is that um, this means so so we can do things like uh, inside of the driver we can do proxies to like I said standalone databases. So the driver can just be like. Uh, uh, basically, a, a Redis client or whatever. But you can also do things like peer to peer protocols. So uh, there doesn't even anymore, there, we, there doesn't even necessarily have to be like store nodes. Uh, 
basically we can just implement peer-to-peer -peer protocols inside of the drivers, which is what, which is how like gossip works in mm -hmm. Onos. Uh, currently, basically the Onos, like the Onos nodes, uh, the classic Onos nodes, um, <clears throat> they talk directly to each other over a gossip protocol. And this is how we can replace something like um, eventually consistent map in, in classic Onos. <laughs> this diagram, the primitive is just like a uh, logical. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's logical. Yeah. Yeah. At eight, the, eight, the drivers are just talking to each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty blurry. Yeah, it, this uh, enabled lots of. I think this was like the yeah, this was the final piece to to sort of getting it where I wanted it to be. Um, yeah. So the way that the there's one more API here. Um, the way that. Um, Storage plugins are defined are using this custom storage plugin resource, and this is what basically is. Um, so this registers a new type of driver um, or a new type of storage, basically with uh, the Atomics controller. So when, like, if you, this is something that the Atomics uh, wrap storage chart creates. Actually, this is from the Atomics wrap storage chart, um, and basically it's telling it's basically telling the Atomics controller that. Stores can be created with the multi raft protocol, and and stores created with the multi raft protocol are associated with uh, this driver image. And so, if you create a primitive that wants that is pointing to a store that's using uh, a multi raft protocol, the autonomous controller will um, configure this specific driver to talk to it. it knows which driver is associated um, with which type of store. And this is how it knows which drivers are are know how to know how to operate on a certain type of primitive. And so the Tox controller does uh, a lot of work wiring everything together. But all of this still, um, I mean, this this all of this amounts to being able to totally change, like be able to use a wide variety of different types of stores and protocols and things like that. Uh, without ever changing the code, which is which is which was my goal. So. And so, just to go over the components one more time. Um, so there's the Atomics API, the new uh, protobuf, gRPC API for primitives, um, the Atomics controller, which basically handles all the wiring of everything together. Uh, the Atomics controller defines some custom resources, store, and uh, different types of primitives. Um, there's the broker, the broker container, uh, which is the registry of primitive information that clients use to uh, figure out where they can uh, connect to, to operate on a specific primitive. Uh, storage plugins, which the components of a storage plugin, each storage plugin provides a controller a driver inside of a driver is an agent. So actually, um, for that was something I forgot. Um, so basically, for each store, uh, so there will be one driver for a specific type of storage, and then for each store uh, using that type of storage, the autonomous controller will create an agent, which is basically just uh, talking to a specific store uh, of that type. Uh, in, in practice, none of that would be seen by the application. Correct. That yeah. would be That's inside, yeah. <clears throat> and then clients, if you're interested, um, yeah, and so uh, the great thing was that the so that last work that was done uh, introducing the sidecars made the Clients insanely simple. Like it's really just a really lightweight uh, wrapper around the gRPC interface. Like this is the entirety of the map primitive. It's 350 lines of code or whatever. And really, you know, all it is is uh, just implementing a nice Go interface uh, for the map primitive. Literally, literally, all it just does is takes a like forget it takes a key turns it into a, a request and sends it off it doesn't know any, any doesn't have to know anything about 
It doesn't care about consistency anymore. There used to be a lot of code in this client, uh, employing like a wrap session and things like that. It doesn't have to do any of that because it's just talking to a sidecar and the sidecar is handling all that. And so, and I'm hoping that this will make it easy to also implement the Java client and things like that. That's it. Do we have a Python client for this now for Facebook or are they doing no. it the other way? Um, no, we haven't done it yet. So how do they, oh, they're using, they're just using gRPC, right? So it doesn't, they're, they're just talking to our, our components. Yeah. They're not talking to the Yeah, they yet. haven't needed to store anything. Yeah. 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 yeah, they've been primarily just dealing with like things like Topo and, and UV. Right. Facebook? Oh, okay. They have a couple of apps that are part yeah. of SD RAM written in Python. So uh, with the new uh, with us with the move to to the whole to Volta, the whole new Volta control new control for Volta, we're looking at some uh, some numbers that uh, were kind of re not requested, but that was that is the target for the new controller to support, mm -hmm. which is uh, in the order of the two million objects, yeah, give or take. I uh, don't have a precise number, not have made the calculation, but it's what it's about 1.5 million flows and 500,000 between everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and when we're looking at uh, the rate of the update is not insanely fast yeah. because these are like subscriber configuration for, for the bond. So it means that, that when the port goes down, you can expect like many, some changes, but not like on the same object very fast, especially. Um, so is there any benchmark that we can relate to to make the claim that we can <laughs> use this for those kind of numbers? Yeah, this is something I, I, so I made a, actually I made a benchmarking framework, but I haven't updated the benchmarks in a while. So my question is, I mean, there are benchmarks like for Dragon Boot, but the question is how much, um, how much overhead atomics adds on some of that, which I'm not sure about which which needs to be tested because there may be performance issues that need to be of work out. It's just not something that we've um, done yet, which I really do want to do. So what, what you're saying is that the, the backend protocol will definitely support these numbers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's just to make sure that the stuff we added on top of it yeah. allows for it. Right. Okay. So if we wanted to use this without Kubernetes, then my understanding is that Kubernetes here gives us two things. There's a Kubernetes API that looks like, like an API gateway that then has everything mm -hmm. onto a Domus controller. Yeah. And then there's the cluster management, sidecar management. Yeah, you need a replacement for the controllers, basically. Mm -hmm. And those are the only things that know about Kubernetes. Those are the only things that depend on the Kubernetes API at all. Right. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you just need some some uh like it can even be done with scripts uh just something to basically do those api calls to to basically configure the broker mm -hmm. um so tell the broker about primitives uh start the driver uh agent or whatever uh start the raft nodes and things like that which which can be done in scripts but that's just not work that's been done at all mm -hmm. It'll take some work, but it's definitely it, it's definitely possible. So, um, I mean, this looks significantly different than like the old atomics. So, the new atomics is how do you define the new atomics? Like a framework for? Yeah, I've I've had trouble. I, I don't know. I've had trouble defining it. <laughs> Figuring out how to describe it. Yeah, in, in like a short sentence or whatever. I don't know. A cloud native framework for. Storage distributing, yeah. I think it's just more than yeah, storage. Distributed like primitives. Just, yeah, distributed primitives. Anyways, pretty pretty amazing, I would say. Yeah, yeah like it's a like, level of generalization. Right? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, yeah, I think it yeah, just starting work on Micronos, it was like a great opportunity to fix. I mean, there's a lot that I've I've learned about what was missing and like what was hard to hard to work with and things like that. And it was a great opportunity, I think. I solved uh, everything I wanted to solve now. So. Makes me want to move away from all this plastic as soon as possible. Yeah, that's what we are doing. 
Yeah, no, it's easy for you. You don't have uh, beefy applications on top of it. Yes. Yeah, segment right. routing. Uh, well, the, 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 the real deal is segment routing, but oh, yeah. Right. yeah. We do have like six applications that are going to migrate. So, yeah. so well, again, it's more than the one other thing um, is like if somebody wants to try this uh, not in conjunction with the topo or config uh, or anything else, is there like a documentation or? I'm working on it now. Yeah. Okay. So for honest, for honest classic, um, we are starting to work on replacing, getting rid of the Java wrap yep. foundation altogether. Uh, and so, and as part of that, I'm. I'm working on lots of documentation, and, and Bill also wants me to do like blog posts um, and things like that. And so I'm going to work on it. Um, hopefully, in the next couple of months, we'll have a lot of good documentation. Nice. And um, and if somebody wants to do it as of like not as of right now, but in the before the documentation is finished, the really the the way to see it to look at something that has already done it is yeah. top or config yeah. and try to match as much as uh, yeah. as much as you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and to Carmelo's sentiment, you know, about the Onos Classic, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I want to um, um, reinvigorate the effort to start Onos Control. Yeah. Uh, but but the idea here is that we wouldn't necessarily bring the, the full uh, spectrum of functionality that Onos Classic has on in terms of the flow control, dealing with groups and meters and stuff like that, which I assume are the core um of what what you would need um, yeah. the idea is just to focus on things that we need um, and you know basically focus primarily on p4 and uh, you know open flow in this particular case would almost be like a second derivative yeah, yeah. so about uh dating honors classic to use atomics cloud it sounds like this is it's going to be more than just replacing the implementation of the storage something. I mean, like the fact that now um, the, the app doesn't have to be aware of the uh, specific of the protocol. I mean, right now the yeah. protocol specific are like leaking everywhere. Right. Like yeah. rule, I don't know. Oh so yeah, those are some so Contained like, in the store, right? A lot of that uh, is yeah. contained in the stores. Yeah. But I, I don't think we're going to be able to get rid of Netty and a lot of the communication that happens between Onos nodes. So I think it has to happen in a couple of phases. So uh, we can get rid of all of the RAF primitives specifically. So uh, basically replace a new implementation of consistent map and all of the other consistent primitives. Yeah. And that will allow us to get rid of the RAF nodes, which is what, which is the biggest thing that I want to get rid of. Um, and after that, separately, a lot of the stores have other types of protocols, there will be eventually a consistent map, which, which uh, I think we'll have to do separately. Uh, there are like a lot of custom gossip protocols. I don't think we can, I don't think we can get rid of those. So we'll have to keep Netty and Cryo and things like that. And a lot of the uh, inter, uh, <coughs> inter cluster configuration, uh, communication. Can I, um, can I throw a wrench in here and say, is it worth it? Yeah, I, mean, I was thinking this. I have to be honest. I mean, it's it's a debate. This yeah. is the first time I've participated in this debate, but by the looks of it, it's going to be yeah, a lot of work. I, it, well, no, I don't think it'll. I don't think it's that much work, really, to replace the just the raft motors, at least. And I think it's a huge benefit because we're getting way more stability mm -hmm. um, just from the raft, just from the raft, uh, the raft implementation. Uh, but I think. The question is, uh, how fast can we get rid of <laughs> Onos Classic altogether? So, I mean, I guess so I don't think it's happening anytime soon. But if, uh, I mean, if we have to replace, I mean, if we have to, it's what Thomas was saying before, right? If we restrict the scope of the exactly. then that's not a lot of that's work. Fair, yeah. I'll give you a couple of ideas. Right now, we have some system for meters, groups, plurals. They're all the same thing. They're data plane entities. Yeah. Um, and that's we need a yeah. system for each, yeah. for each thing. Um, get rid of all the protocols. That's, all that's, the different time. Yeah, that's effectively what we are doing in, uh, in, um, in the Volta community. Very, a very targeted thing just for us. It does a little bit of things, and, and maybe it's worth setting up later today a discussion while you're here. 
I'm thinking like, for example, like I'm more worried about applications, let's say. It's, yeah, the, the complication are on, uh, in, in application logic. It's not in honors. Yeah, system. exactly. Right, that's fair, yeah. So we create a honors classic API that's backed by. <laughs> 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 but the work. but I think, I mean, we have clearly a number of applications which are, you know, sizable and which are still relevant and, and we want to that's what we're using for uh, we're just having people. more and more these days yeah but but the idea here is that we also have a whole bunch of applications that we that have been contributed over the years that are for the most part stale i mean they, they you know they build we ship them but they're stale you know nobody really at least is using them so the idea is that those we would just let those die with honest classic mm -hmm. and i'd rather have a kind of a, a fresh approach to things uh, not necessarily bring the old baggage with us. Um, yeah, if if you look at the honest build profile and just look at what we use in SD Fabric, those are probably the the most active apps. Precisely right, and I would prefer to build something of potentially, um, um, you know, with a very narrow scope uh, that does what we needed to do uh, as a as kind of as a bare minimum, and then we can build out from there if needed. As, as others discover functionality, let's say that it was previously an almost classic, but it's not here, then we can just talk about adding it. And, but before that, let's just bring just what we need. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, design discussion is in order, at least to get a sense. Yeah, of but, but that's, that's a whole different topic. Uh, but at least I want to make sure we have a clear understanding of what it takes to uh, to support the new atomics in Honest Classic. Yes. At least that's what Pure is working on today. Correct. I mean, I was, a different subject, yes. I was thinking that if you hide it all in the stores, there's effectively not that much because you're not touching any application. Right. So you just hide it back there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and supposedly nobody sees it. So there's the work over there. You still keep the eventually consistent map, the strongly consistent right. map, yeah. and all, all of that. You touch no code in the apps and, 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 and shove it enough down there, it should be fairly. Yeah, I think cool. the if we're I think actually if we also need to um provide some way to still deploy it on bare metal, that, that might actually be, be more work. Uh, um no. Yeah, COVID, because COVID you, you're kind of losing the you losing a lot of the orchestration control capability. Uh, uh, so yeah. The complexity you were describing goes away. Yeah. 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 So so say call it call it on three dot x and if somebody wants it, it goes to three dot x and we yeah, just support yeah. from Kubernetes. That's what I would prefer. Yeah. Play, I, I really don't want it's a major API change, it's not backwards compatible. It, if somebody wants the old stuff, it goes to 2.x, it's supported as LTS and everything. We do the 2.7 as the final, no, 2.8 as the final LTS of Onus, classic with the old atomics. Yeah. That's it. Are we originally planning to actually introduce this change in 2.8? So are you right. suggesting that we actually change the plan? I mean, we, we still have, have another LTS before, before we actually make that change. All 2.7. Uh, yeah, so we would have to, I mean, we would have to redesignate 2.7, I think, as an LTS, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which, you know, the LTS is rather arbitrary anyway, right? It's just yeah. a question of uh, what attention we give it. I mean, so we could certainly do that. And also, uh, to be honest, uh, like, for example, as, as I said in TST the other day, Volta is not going to move from 2.5. Whenever mm -hmm. we're going to move, we're going to move to the new controller. So yeah. Yeah. it might not even make sense to call an mm -hmm. LTS. If we want to do it, sure, why not? But uh... well, I mean, yeah, I, think, I, I think just as a formality, uh, kind of as a just in print, uh, principle thing, it doesn't really make sense to be the kind of the hanging tail end relief, not to be an LTS. Uh, I mean, why bother even having it? Sort of right. Um, so I think if if we do plan to at at, at the point where we decide to call something three point we should, um, the, the preceding release should be designated as an LTS. Then, then maybe 2.7 LTS and 2.8 yeah. is actually 3.0. Yes. So I think, I think um, you know, I would be perfectly fine with sort of changing our story and, uh, you, know, just, you know, communicating to the outside world, you know, upon further consideration, 
um, the move to um, you know the uh, Atomix uh, that's uh, cloud native would require certain uh, limitations and therefore we will support 2.7 as an LTS, which will be the last release that we support outside of the frame of Kubernetes and Helm. Uh, following releases will require that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. So, I mean, we can, that's something we can convey probably, um, we have some time to convey it at least i would i would sit on this for a little bit let's consider all of the implications uh we can always communicate that next week at the time we'll probably be doing the release uh, i think we'll do, be, do, be doing release either next week or week right a week after that are there any are there any requirements to call an lts release no LTS? it's just an arb it's just a commitment really it's just a commitment to Blackboard stuff. To, to, exactly. Yes. We will not do it. is the best cherry picking. <laughs> and which, which in the end is going to actually be fairly complicated because maybe we can cherry pick like stuff that is not in the stores, but then as soon as you touch the stores, which are affected, yeah. the ones we yeah, yeah. touch the most. Yes. Not only that, sorry. So. But but I think that's to be expected, right? I mean, we we oh. that was the same thing we've done there with Peacock and moved to two point oh. Uh, yep. I mean, we didn't have a, if you recall the Peacock, which was kind of the, the future Comcast release, but they never switched to it. Um, the tail end, um, the last one X release, then we didn't have an LTS release until 2.2, .2, I believe, because it yeah. took us a while to solidify the new, um, the new way of doing things. So yes. it's possible that the Y release may not be the first uh, LTS 3X release either. But but I think the last one of the of the line sort of has to be. No, that's fine, maybe. Works. Yeah, it's amazing work, Jordan. Yeah. We uh, do we have majority to actually make that decision right here right now, or do we want to have a separate discussion on that? Uh, uh, TST majority. Um, I think, so. yeah, we do. I think I think we do. Brian's not here, but I'm not sure he's necessarily a stakeholder um, that's terribly vested in in either of these approaches. I mean, I would be definitely in favor of that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we do. All right. So if there's no objections, let's make it so, and then. Um, I'm going to then draft out an email. I'll send it just to this team before sending it to the whole community. And uh, so that way we can, you know, make sure that it's reasonably comprehensive and accurate. And uh, we'll probably, we'll plan on sending it out sometimes at the end of next week. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. And that way we can limit the amount of work that we, you know, uh, we need to do. All right. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.